Buenos dias, <laughs> and welcome to my talk about Merck's or mission, having a productive relationship with our remote uh, teams. This talk is geared towards um, particularly working with remote teams, but the principles can be applied to just about anything. If you're running a team, the principles here are important to running a team. So as you listen, I want you to think of your own team. Are they more like mercenaries waiting for the next project, the next thing to do? Or are they more like missionaries sharing and uniting a shared goal? Oh, the remote. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, sir. All right. Wrong one. There we go. So about 10 years ago, Microsoft purchased Nokia. Some of you may have been around to remember this. They paid $7.2 billion for Nokia. And it was a match made in heaven, right? Here was the number one operating system company in the world and the number one, they were falling to number two at that point, manufacturer of phones, which explains why today when you walk away from your Windows computer, it's a seamless integration with your cell phone, right? <laughs> I can't even have a straight face when I say that. No, that hasn't been the case at all. So what happened? What happened? We know that in fact, they ended up writing off the whole $7.2 billion as a tax write-off. During this talk, I want to share with you what I've discovered, both in personal experience and through research, can happen when you work with remote teams or remote companies. So a little review about what we're gonna be talking about today. First, a little bit about me so that you know why this is important to me. After that, we'll talk about the outsourcing today. What is it like, the most common way of outsourcing? Then we'll talk about the what, giving and taking, the sunshine model, and finally, with a blueprint of things that you can do and start using to work with remote studios right away, okay? First, a little bit about me. Um, let me introduce myself. Think of me as a walkthrough body. I don't know, do, do people still use those? <laughs> I remember going through lots of walkthroughs when I was a kid. Um, yeah, guiding you through this particular subject. So this is me. <laughs> My name is Gabriel Ruiz, but most people call me Gabe. Um, and I am a nerd. <laughs> Bottom line, I am a nerd. I'm proud of it. I had one of my, when I had my own company, I had one, one of my cousins who worked with me. That it's like he was insulted when somebody called him a nerd. And it's like, no, that's who I am. And I'm proud of it. I'm a nerd. For over 20 years, I've been working uh, in a lot of things. But the important thing for you to know about me is that I'm somebody who loves video games and just thrives in learning environment. But most importantly, I love helping people create some awesome stuff. <laughs> I do. And helping others brings me just as much satisfaction as uh, doing this stuff myself. I'm pretty creative myself, but helping other people create is just as much fun. I have a degree that is focused in communication, psychology, counseling, and culture otherwise known as a degree in theology. That was my first degree. Um, but also I have degrees in design and in software development. I have a degree um, in graphic design and another degree in um, software engineering. Um, for the last 20 years, I have worked creating value, including about six years as an executive in my own software company. And during that time, we used both local and outsourced talent to develop our software. 
Over the last four years, however, I've been working at Pickpock, um, and I came at a perfect time. Three of those years have been used as a studio relationship manager. Once we formalized our relationship with Wizard, at that time it was called Wizard Fun Factory in Medellin, now uh, Pickpock Medellin. I was at the right place at the right time. So this role has allowed me to observe and participate in the developing of this lasting relationship between two studios, and it has been a great experience. I want to be clear that a lasting relationship or collaboration between two studios requires more than just simply relationship. There are financial and legal considerations that you need to be very careful with when considering a remote studio. This chat isn't about that. This chat is about the perspective of a studio relationship manager, emphasis on relationship, okay? So with that out of the way, let's talk about outsourcing today, okay? There's different names for it. Some of them can be co-development, which is a little bit different. In this term, I'm using it as a blanket term to include any participation, any partnership with an external studio. Like I said, for 20 years, I have been a entrepreneur. Um, so I actually have personal experience when I had my own company, um, Unident Software Company. We use both near and far shore uh, outsourcing partners. And during that time, to be honest, I fell into some patterns that were less than successful. And so today I want to, us to dive into what it looks when it goes bad. What, what does that look like before we come up with some ideas of how we can do it right. Let's talk about the Mushroom Kingdom, okay? Has anybody heard the expression, I'm being treated like a mushroom? If you haven't, it means that you keep somebody in the dark and you feed them manure, for lack of a better word, <laughs> okay? That's what it means to treat somebody like a mushroom, similar to mushroom uh, farming. When we have uh, uh, outsourced partners, quite often we fall into this trap of treating them this way. I certainly did it. Um, in my case, I had access to my wife's dental practice and many other dental practices around me, but I never even thought about connecting the remote studio with the people that were actually I was learning from. It was too much work. It was. And the only thing I did was basically give them the stuff that my local studio didn't want to do. <laughs> and whenever I was in a big, big trouble, I would then bring them in just to kind of end things. And what happens when you do this is that it puts a remote studio into a survival mode. And being treated like a mushroom makes it even worse. Scientifically, we know that we are not at our best during duress. Duress will get you out of a fire, but very rarely does it keep you from falling into a very similar fire, fire down the road. This is the way of the mercenary. <laughs> the word of the hired company, the outsourced partner. So what is the alternative? This is a quote from John Dewar, famous capitalist. What we need are it's teams of missionaries and not mercenaries. Now, I want to make sure that we are clear in this. The word missionary carries a lot of historical baggage. Unfortunately, quite often he has been associated with colonialism and with subjugation. But today I want us to think a little bit different with the word missionary. So when I say missionary, I want you to think the group on the right, X-Men, rather than the classical thought of missionary, okay, the ones on the right-hand side. We don't use the word missionary a lot in modern times, but we always very frequently talk about mission. So I want you to take a moment to reflect on your organization's mission. Is it a rallying point that inspires a group like the X-Men? Or is it just a checkbox that a mercenary group would feel more in touch with? 
I heard about the concept of missionaries and mercenaries for the first time in the book Empowered by Mar Marty Kagan. If you are a producer or if you are somebody who's a leader, I highly recommend you read this book. And he talks about how we want to ensure that every member of the product organization is joined because they sincerely believe in the larger process. We need to ensure that people in the team are true believers, kind of like Stan Lee's true believers. And interesting enough, he in this book argues against outsourcing because of the mercenary nature of it. Good news to tell you today, I think we have found an alternative to it. Reading this was a real opener for me. I realized that that's why I had had such a hard time with my outsourcing partners. It wasn't the kind of work, it was the way I was treating them. It included one terrible moment in which we outsource to a company and then they outsource to another company. And if you can imagine, if it's bad to keep your user away from your person that is working on the work, can you imagine two ways down the road? It was horrible. But I was treating them like that. So around the same time that I was reflecting on this, I was reading this book, is when we started working with Medellin. Now we had several outsourcing partners at the time. We had some in the Ukraine, we had some in the Philippines, some in Peru. In the relationship with Medellin started very similar to those. But it was really interesting, even before we outright acquired Pickpock Medellin, I began to notice a difference. And to be clear, the great amount of that difference was the quality of their work and the amazing leadership that they had, but there was something, a little something extra in there. The final piece of the puzzle fell in when I read this book by um, Roger L. Martin, um, another great book, by the way, for you if you're a leader to read, um, a different, a new way of thinking. And in this book, he talked about the high profile partnerships like that one that we talked at the beginning between Microsoft and uh, Nokia or Yahoo and Tumblr. And at the core issue of these problems, he identified a one single thing. And that was that they focused on what they could get out of the company rather than what they needed to give. Martin's point about talking about value applies not only to mergers and acquisition. If you have been in a long lasting relationship, you know that this is true. And if you are a good product manager, a good product owner, you know that you have to give value to get value. It's just a principle that applies to everything. And at Pickpock, this principle, I noticed how it became a reality. Even before we bought it, there was a feeling of what could we contribute to this remote studio, not just simply what could we extract from them. So if there's one thing that I want you to remember today, it's this simple statement. You have to give value to get value. You have to give value to get value. So let's talk a little bit about what does that mean? What do I have to give? Or what do I have to give? Let's talk about this. In the book that uh, Roger L. Martin uh, wrote, he identifies four things that you, your studio has to give. The first one is smart capital. And this is on mergers and acquisitions. So smart capital, management oversight, but I want to just to play close attention to the last two, transferring of valuable skills and sharing of valuable capabilities. This is something that you don't have to merge, you don't have to purchase, that you can do with your remote studio with the outsourcing relationship to make it better. So we're gonna concentrate on those two. Let's talk about what you have to give. Number one, your biggest asset is human capital both your team members and your customers. 
Your players or your customers are the reason why you do what you do. And if that's not the reason, then you're in the wrong chat. I can't help you with that. Let's talk afterwards, okay? But that is the reason you do what you do. So shielding your clients from your partners only limits the, the, the potential to create a powerful product. Yes, there's risk with it, and that's why you need to make sure that you have selected very carefully your partner and that you have very strong contracts, <laughs> okay? And you verify, trust, but verify. But keeping them away is going to provide a challenge. And I'm, I'm glad I assisted one yesterday with a whole bunch of heads of studios talking about this. And they were very clear that you can't just simply hand people stuff over <laughs> and hope that it's going to magically happen. What you're going to get is not what you want. You need to dedicate time and you need to make sure that they understand why. The second thing that you can give is sharing your experience. In our studio, it has been pretty good. We have lots of years of experience, 27 years that PickBuck has been around. So we have tons of experience to share. And every time that the remote partner or studio or outsourced partner grows, your value increases. So make sure that you are sharing your expertise. And finally, your team has ex exper ex sorry, experience. Your team has expertise. That made me missing a remote studio. Now for Pickbuck, that's pretty easy. We're a big company. So like we have a games uh, research department. We have analytics. We have all these really strong departments that we can share between our studios, uh, that expertise. But even smaller studios, have things that they can give. There's something that you can, unique that you can offer to your partner. It might be agile development, it might be a leadership style, it might be production expertise, or even an art pipeline. Identify where you can bring value to your remote studio. One thing should be clear by now, and that is, if you are a very young startup, this might not be for you because you might not be able to give something yet. So keep that at the back of your mind. You have to give to receive, right? You have to give value to get value. So yes. So what do you get for that? <laughs> You're probably wondering, okay, that sounds like a lot of work. And it is. If you thought that you were going to come here and be like, oh, it's magical. I know exactly, you know, you just hand them stuff and magically happens. I'm sorry. That's, I think Rick, my coworker, writes fiction and you can, you can talk to him. The reality is that it's a lot of work. So what do you get for this? Fingers crossed it's tacos, but really, let's, let's talk about the benefits, okay? The first benefit, the most obvious one, is reduced labor cost about 35 to 45% discount on labor. Um, and to be clear, this is not PICPOS specific, this is general uh, industry standards. You can find higher discounts, but it's important to avoid predatory fa uh, practices when forming a long-term partnership. In my experience, any short-term savings that you might get are gonna be eaten up very quickly in lost time and lost revenue. A studio that is in survival mode will likely bite back or play dead. And neither of those things are good things for you to have a relationship based on. So reduction in cost, expanded operations. Your remote studio partners can also give you the ability to work on ports, um, develop for new, new hardware, um, expansions, and so on. And they mentioned this yesterday as well, so I'm glad that we were in the same, in the same boat, but it actually allows you, if you time it just right, to extend your production time greatly. There are several projects at PickPock where we have used QA from their side, and now we work throughout the day, they start work at two o'clock in the morning, their side. By the time we come back into the office, there's stuff that we can address. So played the right way 
it is it's a little bit challenging having different time zones, but it can really be a great asset um, around you to have more operational hours. And finally, a remote studio brings new perspectives. They tend to be younger devs, which is a good thing and sometimes a challenging thing, but it definitely gives you a fresh perspective. Uh, one of the persons uh, talking in the panel yesterday stole one line from me, and that is if you want to understand your own processes in your company, go ahead and get a partner to work with you and you very quickly will realize what your, product, your, your processes are like. So it gives you that additional um, perspective. And of course, depending on where it is, you're gonna get an idea of a global market, not just simply what you are in, where you're at. So 55% to 65%, I'm sure that some of you are completely still thinking about Woo, yes, that's a lot of savings. But there is a catch. If all that you give is money, you're likely to get exactly what you're paying for. Just like Microsoft discovered, you have to give more than just simply dollars. Otherwise, you might end up with a bargain bin, bin mercenary, like our bargain bin mercenary over here. And trust me, I've, I've hired those and you don't want that, okay? So you have to be willing to give more than just money. So let's talk about the sunshine model, okay? I call it the sunshine model because completely opposite from the mushroom kingdom, everything is kept in the surface. Everything is kept where people can see it. Let's make a couple points clear before we go into this. I realize that this is not a magic bullet, okay? It's not all rainbows and, you know, this is not magic, but I've seen it work in our studio, and our studio is by no means perfect. And second, we're talking about a lasting relationship. If you're looking for somebody to do a job for you quickly, this might not be the best way to do it. Although, if you're looking for someone to do something quickly, there are challenges there as well. You're still going to have to dedicate time and effort and give more than just money. So the Sunshine model revolves around one central truth, and that is that the customer, okay, is the reason you exist. It's represented by the sun over here, and uh, they are the lifeblood. And even if your focus shifts towards shareholders, <coughs> Blizzard, um, your business won't survive unless you support your players. So in this model, both you, your local and remote studios are connected with the customer, directly or indirectly. While each studio can maintain independence, they must share a pool of resources, okay? And yes, that includes the not so glamorous stuff. It's okay to have the crappy jobs. It's okay to have the tough deadlines and the limited information, but you're both working on it rather than delegating that to our remote studio and putting them in a position where they're gonna be in a survival mode. The key element to this, and we're gonna hear it over and over again, is communication. Depending on the scope, you should have daily or at least weekly synchronization between your studios. Some might think that this is overkill, but the truth is the sooner that you can spot a problem, the sooner that you can address it. As in the Agile Manifesto, it says that business people and developers must work daily through a project. The remote studio, there's no possibility for co-location, so it's twice as critical. Sunshine disinfects, sunshine reveals, and sunshine keeps a relationship warm and growing. So the elements of this model, let's talk about it. Like I said, customer-centric. When I had my own company, one of my lead tech person, I remember him screaming at one of our software engineers, just effing do it. <laughs> and I was like, hey, let's talk to HR. <laughs> uh, and it was a phrase that, to be honest, with the same employee, like a 
couple months later, I found myself saying it in my head. I didn't say it out loud, but I found it saying it in my head. And as tempting as it is to run things just because I say so, that is not the way to have an effective, lasting relationship. You have to be able to understand why you're doing what you're doing. In yesterday's chat with the studio lead, someone said, like, if you just give them a tree to make, they're going to give you a tree. You have to make sure that they buy in into what your version of that tree is. Why is it important? Otherwise, you're not going to get something that matches. I've heard a lot of corporate jargon. If there's one that I really dislike is let's keep the noise to signal ratio low. And I understand that there's room for it. But my advice when working with a remote studio is don't. There's so many things that you think, oh, that is just common knowledge. Like, I know it, right? And you're thinking, I'm just going to give them extra information. It's not necessary. Don't. They're not there with you. What may be totally pointless to you might be key for them to develop what they need to develop. I'm a TikTok person, much to my children's dismay. <laughs> um, and there's this, this one person there that acts different ways, acts like, a, in, in, in like she'll have three panels, and one of them will be like real life, claymation, Pixar. And in the claymation and Pixar one, she kind of has to exaggerate her movements to get the point across. And that is true for a remote studio. You have to make sure that things are clear and overdo it. It might look like overacting, but it's key in order for you to continue. Like we said before, you need to share resources. And it goes both ways. There's a temptation to be, especially if you're a larger studio, to be like, oh, we know everything. And so we're just going to tell them what to do. You'd be surprised at the information that you can get if you truly share the resources between you and them. And finally, you must have a growth mindset. When I first started working at PickPock, joining both studios, my manager told me, you make sure and let them know that we know that they're going to make mistakes and that our company core value is to learn from our mistakes. So we want to know. We don't want you to hide them. And because you are such a distance, when people hide something from you, it's going to be very hard to find. However, it will come up. And it will probably come up when your product is out. So you want to make sure that those problems come in early and frequently, and that they know that you have a growth mindset to help you with that. So let's visit this again. We need teams that are missionaries and not teams of mercenaries. What I've discovered is that missionaries and mercenaries are a matter of how you treat your team. An outsourcing partner can be a missionary, doesn't have to be a mercenary. They need to be invested in what you're doing. The missionaries are missionaries, not just because of their set of beliefs, which is important. You need to have culture parity, but also because they're treated like that. They know that they're taken care of. They know that the failures are seen as opportunities. When you treat a remote team like a valuable extension of your mission, that group will become missionaries, and they will un you will unlock potential innovation, trust, and a lasting relationship, partnership between you guys. All right, so let's get towards the end. Let's talk about blueprints, okay? So that was all theory. Let's talk about, in practice, what are some things that you can use with your remote studio? It's work, but it's work that is worth doing for the benefits that we have discussed. So let's talk about these building blocks over here. The first one that I have discovered, and this has been from personal experience and we're working with Medellin, is that it's very important to have a time overlap. Okay? Anywhere between three and six hours in the research that I have done, 
agrees that that's what you want to have. Like I said, communication is crucial. So you need to have a time for people to communicate directly. Email is fine, messages are fine, but ultimately the best communication is going to happen face to face, at least through teleconferencing. That's all that you have. <laughs> you need to be able to have that overlapping time. Number two, there has to be a common language between both places. And not just jargon, but also they need to speak English, you need to speak English, or you need to be able to speak the language that they speak. Okay? Um, next, inform staff. The rest of your studio needs to understand the role of the remote studio, and we'll, we'll deepen in each one of these and how it impacts your work. And finally, coordinator, you should have somebody who understands both the local and remote studios. Um, and that's an essential part of having the relationship run smoothly, even if it's a little self-serving. <laughs> All right, time. At PICPOC, we have four days overlap. They're one day before us. We actually have found that this is beneficial to us because that means that each side has one day that there's no interruptions, okay? And it feels quite good. Um, so you want to have at least four days in common with the place that you're working on, and then three to six hours each day. Um, you can, on occasion, work outside of working hours, either you or them, but it's not sustainable. One of you is gonna get tired. With my previous company, the other team was in a place completely opposite of mine, and I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning to communicate with them. At four o'clock in the morning, I can even find my mouth to brush my teeth, much less have a decent conversation with another human being in very heavily accented English. So make sure that this is not a common occurrence, okay? I, myself, choose to get up at 5.30 in the morning and work with them at 6 o'clock in the morning, but you can't expect everybody to do that. Um, and they had changed their hours to go from 9 to 6 p.m. so that we have more time overlap. But once again, this is not an extreme. People are not working in the middle of the night uh, so that they can work with us. Um, we have used several kinds of handover documents. Um, here are some of the good ones. QA, for example, uses an Excel spreadsheet for handovers. Has worked really, really good. Production teams usually use JIRA or some kind of that type of uh, system. And art teams usually collaborate in Miro or Figma. Um, and that allows for asynchronous collaboration when they are not there to meet and talk directly. So that's the time overlap, talking about common language. Communication, hard of working it out. Communication, communication, communication. And it starts with a spoken language. For our studio, we have discovered that B1 is a classification of proficiency in English, is the sweet spot to find. Of course, there are challenges with culture and accents and beat rooms. I have to tell them if it sounds like an E sound, when you're talking to a Kiwi, they mean eh, bedroom, <laughs> okay? Um, but they need to start with a common, common ability to talk to each other. Um, in addition to that, we actually offer uh, language training on both sides, on their side in English and our side in Spanish. Um, and we offer the opportunity for people to come visit across, and that helps you increase your language, improve your language uh, skills. Um, yep, it's not just the common language, it's identity. <laughs> Please, if your studio is about making the best games ever, and your remote studio is about making the best art ever, you're gonna have some problems. So you need to make sure that your remote partner has a similar set of beliefs to yours. The same thing with culture. Culture is important. I'm so glad that we worked with 
Pequot Medellin, they have a similar work ethic that we do. They don't, didn't believe, for instance, in, in uh, crunch, okay? You might think, oh, it's fantastic that they crunch and we don't. This is gonna come back to bite you. At some point, this is gonna cause an issue between you and the remote studio. So make sure that you have similar culture and finally, technical language. When I first joined PickPock, I remember saying, hey, we should advertise this thing, and somebody was like, we don't say that, Just, no, no, advertise. We surface it to the players. Okay, fine. We need to surface this to our players, right? So make sure that you have a way of having that language be the same on both sides, and that's gonna require time. Um, yeah. Informed staff, this is important. People on both sides need to feel secure. It doesn't happen a lot in our studio, but I have heard it. Like, I'm nervous that I'm training my replacement. And this is one of the reasons why, remember at the beginning I said, you can get better deals, but probably you shouldn't. If you're really underpaying your remote studio, people here are gonna think for sure that my job is being replaced. So be careful how you do that and make sure that your local studio understands that their job is secure and that the remote studio is a enhances their productivity rather than replacing it. Having them visit across has helped a lot. You know, it's a lot easier to mistrust somebody that you've never seen, you've never met. Once you begin to meet these people and realize they're real people like you, it's really hard to mistrust them in that way. So that has been something that has helped. It's not necessary, but it does help. And we also have things like lab days, which we have one time a week, and game jams in which we encourage both sides to participate together. And that helps build those bonds, which makes it less hard, um, yeah, harder to mistrust when you are seeing these people and in, in connecting with them. And lastly, Having a relationship coordinator is key to maintaining a good relationship. Um, in the past, outsourcing managers tended to do this for like things like specialist localization and so on. But if you're looking for a sustained relationship, it's important to have somebody, and these are some good attributes for that person to have. You're looking for somebody who's fluent in both languages. There's some things that are really hard to explain in somebody else's language. Um, and so being able to speak both languages, this person is able to translate words and culture to both sides. So you're looking for somebody who is fluent in you know, their, their culture, the language, but also the culture. You want a people person? Um, you have to be willing to step out there. I get up every morning and I have a list of key people on the other side, and I'm like, good morning, good morning, hi, how are you, hello, and just text them that to keep that connection open. I cannot sit and wait for people to come and contact me. When I do that, nothing happens. When I do this, quite often then people during the day will contact me and say, hey, I'm having problems with this. I am out of sight, out of mind, <laughs> so make sure it's a people person. And finally, somebody who's product-minded, ideally. You want something who understands business, who understands, can think strategically, um, and can help with this process of creating value um, rather than just simply be friends. <laughs> you are creating a product. There is a very, very key to what you're doing. You want to have somebody there that understands that. So yeah, Deadpool, you're right. That was a little bit self-serving there. So to review, mercenaries are made by the way you treat people, keeping them at arm's length. To build lasting relationships, you have to give value to get value. It needs to be beyond just money, <laughs> okay? Sharing access to your team, your customers, your expertise and experience will reduce the cost and expand your production. It's gonna take a little bit longer, but it's gonna be worth it. Players are the reason why you create games. Make sure that they are included and your partners have access to the information that you're getting from them. 
And communication is key. Over communicate, please, please. You don't know how much of my work has been like, they wanna help you, talk to them. And on this side, they want your help. Go ahead and talk to them. So please, you need to have that communication and shared resources, have a growth mindset, make sure that when you're growing, you grow together, okay, and both benefits. Thank you very much. Um, and now we'll open up if there are any questions. Any questions? It's okay. I'm available around. Come and talk to me. Um, yep. Um, look me up. Give me a call. <laughs> There's my phone number. I love talking relationships between studios. Um, I'm an agile coach, so I love to talk about how relationships improve the way that you work. All right. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>